So, all right. So, Libby Copeland is an award-winning journalist and author who writes from New York about culture and science. As a freelance journalist, she writes for such media outlets as the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Atlantic, and Smithsonian Magazine. Her book, The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are, published by Abrams in 2020, explores the rapidly evolving phenomena, phenomenon of home DNA testing, its implications for how we think about family and ourselves, and its ramifications for American culture broadly. The Wall Street Journal says it's a fascinating account of lives dramatically affected by genetic sleuthing. The New York Times writes, before you spit in that vial, read this book. The Washington Post says the lost family reads like an Agatha Christie mystery and wrestles with some of the biggest questions in life. Who are we? What is family? Are we defined by nature, nurture, or both? It was recently named to the Guardian's list of the best books of 2020. And so without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and get right on into the questions. Hi. Thanks for having me, Adrian. Of course. Welcome. Um, so the first question is, how did you come to write The Lost Family? So um, I've been a journalist for a little over 20 years. And um, the stories that always spoke to me were not always the stories that I was assigned to do. Um, I was at The Washington Post for about 10 years. And um, at The Post, there's a lot of stories that revolve around DC or revolve around um, getting access to people who are very important. And in order to get access to people who are very important, you have to go through the gatekeepers. And I always liked the stories that involved not going through gatekeepers, right? I always liked the stories that were about ostensibly ordinary people, but who people who were extremely fascinating and I felt important and who had something to teach uh, the rest of us. Um, and I liked kind of, I've always liked those kind of intimate stories that have to do with identity and selfhood and our moral compasses, right? And how do we develop those? And how do we decide what's the right thing to do? And how do we, um, like, what is motivation? And what is personal narrative? And all that kind of stuff around, like, you know, it's sort of more in the psychological realm. Um, and I was interested in science, too. Uh, and so I've written a lot of stories that have to do with um, both, you know, intimate stories of people and also the sciences. Uh, and it, it kind of came together about four years ago. I was talking to my editor at the Washington Post, uh, and we were talking about DNA testing, which at the time was just kind of coming into mainstream consciousness. It had been around for a while. A lot more people were testing, not nearly as many as, has test, have, as have tested now. Um, but we were starting to hear stories kind of bubbling up about people who took a test and they got a very unexpected result, right? They got something that kind of spun their head around. It made them realize that there was something really important about themselves, their families, their genetic roots that they didn't know about. And as we would learn, it would then irrevocably change their lives. So I set out to understand this phenomenon. I thought it was really fascinating because this is technology shaping our most intimate selves, right? Um, this is me going in with an expectation of something that's gonna be fun and light and getting something else entirely. And then it's like, what do I do now, right? So I wrote a story about this for the Washington Post and um, and the story went viral and um, I had put an email address at the bottom because I figured, you know, this I've got there's more stories to hear. And I, and I was I was right. I got this complete flood of reader emails, like literally like 400 emails in the first few weeks. after wow. the program. I was underwater. I had trouble like replying to all of them. Each one was a story. Each one was somebody saying that was a great story that you wrote. I want to tell you mine now. Right. And these stories were unbelievable. Um, they were people making discoveries about themselves that was allowing them to rewrite their understanding of the past and the past, you know, it shapes us now. We may not always know how it's shaping us, but sometimes with the discovery of DNA, we come to realize that certain things that didn't make sense before suddenly make a whole lot of sense. Right. And then we're kind of making connections with people we never knew we were related to and learning things about ourselves and sort of where we came from. So I started talking to these people on the phone and I was so moved by these stories. And they were, I think, you know, this stuff hits us where we are at our most vulnerable because this is um, stuff about, you know, how we construct our own identities. 
and our, you know, most close relationships with like our parents, right? So something that kind of comes in and changes your perspective on that, that's like a really, really big deal. And what I realized was that this was a phenomenon that was not limited to a particular segment of American society, that it was broad, it was like a kind of a broad thing that was happening, that was changing the shape of the family. And it was a, a, a kind of a seismic cultural change. And I thought, wow, you know, this is a really big deal. This is like an era. And we're gonna be talking about it in a few decades. We're gonna look back and be like, wow, can you believe that happened? I wanna like capture it. I wanna write about it. I wanna, I wanna be in this. Uh, and that was the genesis of the lost family. <laughs> wow. So, it, well, I mean, yeah. And when you read the book, it really is just filled with people's stories. So yeah, I can see what, but that's incredible that you got that many emails in one weekend. Um, yeah. Moving on, uh, the story of Alice Collins, uh, is it Playbook? Yeah, you, you pronounced oh, it exactly okay. right, yeah. Great, so Alice Collins Playbook framed your book. Without spoiling the story, could you explain why her singular quest provides such a powerful window into home DNA testing? Yeah, so Alice is the central narrative of the book. Um, I chose her because her story is really, really compelling and fascinating. It takes place over a long period of time, and she's like the Miss Marple of her own, right? Miss Marple is, the, you know, the the um, woman in, who's always solving cases in the Agatha Christie mysteries, right? She is like the Miss Marple in her own mystery, and the mystery is like an existential mystery. It's not like who killed who, it's who am I, right? So it's a nonfiction kind of detective story. It's a genetic detective story. Um, and I chose her because um, I, I, will, I wanted to write a book that read like a novel, even though it was nonfiction, right? I wanted it to be unput downable. Um, and I wanted that both because I wanted readers to enjoy themselves. Um, and because, you know, I was gonna be weaving in a lot of science and um, some, even some philosophy and bioethics and questions around identity and things like that. And I, I wanted to be able to do that to give it meaning, but with a light touch so that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, you keep coming back because you're really interested in seeing what happens to Alice, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so Alice, she tests in 2012. Um, so that's eight years ago. That's nine years ago. Um, that is not a very long time in the context of your life probably, but it's an extremely long time in the context of this industry of recreational DNA testing, very long time. Um, and um, in terms of what, in terms of what's on offer, in terms of what you can find out, um, you know, we happen to be in this like tremendous, incredible moment where you can test and you can find out an enormous amount where um, genealogy is like, there's never been a better time to be a genealogist or to do a home DNA test, right? Like you're gonna find out so much, but 2012, um, was different. It was just kind of like the dawn of this. So, um, so she takes a test, not knowing what she's going to find, not even knowing how reliable the results are going to be. But she knows, she knows a few things. She knows, number one, she's a genealogist. She's done a ton of research on her family. And she knows where they all come from. She knows that she is primarily Irish American with a little um, British and Scottish thrown in. So she, her whole family is British Isles, right? Both sides of the family um they're on her father's side they're irish immigrants so she has a very strong sense of irish identity um and she is one of seven collins siblings and they all have a very strong sense of irish identity because of how they were raised so she goes into this test and she spits in the vial and she gets the results back and lo and behold they're not what she expects they are suggesting that she is half ashkenazi jewish which is a term for jews from central and eastern europe who have a unique genetic signature that is different from the genetic signature of somebody who has, um, you know, roots in Ireland. Um, and she is, you know, confounded. And so she figures, well, ancestry is not ready for prime time yet. They, they clearly don't really know what they're doing with the science yet. And in fact, the test was new. So that made a lot of sense as an assumption. Um, but then she takes another test at 23andMe because she's a, you know, an analytical person and she's not gonna stop there. She wants to see. And of course, you probably know where this is going. 23andMe's test confirms the ancestry results. And that's when she realizes, oh, okay, I have a puzzle on my hands. Uh, let me investigate. And what she thinks is going to be, you know, maybe just a little bit of digging turns into a two and a half year odyssey that becomes her full-time job. Um, it's incredibly complicated, the work that she does. And, and Alice is this 
you know, tireless, dogged, f funny, lovable, um, you know, kind of just, she's so analytical that she can sit and for hours and hours she can sift through data because that's her background. Um, and she's really good with technology. Um, she's actually really good at all these things that I'm really bad at. So <laughs> when I would go and interview her, she lives in Washington state, she would have like, you know, her computer and her big monitor and she would be like, so then I did this. And so then I did that. And she had like these big spreadsheets up and she's showing me all this scientific stuff. And I'm like, what, you know, it was, it was, it, it, it was a job that most of us would have just thrown up our hands and said, this is impossible. Um, and, you know, even experienced genetic genealogists and search angels have told me like, they're fairly astonished at what she did. She's an astonishing person. Um, so, so Alice's story is great. But the reason that I think it also works well as a window onto the larger phenomenon of DNA surprises is her story is very unusual, but it contains other stories within it. What do I mean by that? I mean that she goes through and investigates methodically each possibility, right? Each possible explanation for her unexpected ancestry, starting with the most likely and moving on to increasingly wild theories. Um, because she's, again, has such a kind of scientific mind, she does this in a very methodical way. And at each turn, when she dismisses a theory um, and moves on to the next, I get to kind of examine what it's like for people when it turns out that that is the explanation. So she starts with the theory that her dad is not genetically related to her. And that's a phenomenon known as an NPE or non-paternity event. It's one of the most, if not the most common kinds of DNA surprise. And it's, and it's affecting a lot of Americans right now. Um, and it would absolutely make sense that if you were expecting to be entirely one thing and you turn out to be half unexpected ancestry, the most likely explanation, if, if, assuming that the, um, you know, the ethnicity estimate is solid, um, and that's something we can talk about because they're not always perfect, um, but assuming that that's solid, the most likely explanation would be that you're not genetically related to dad. And I get to tell some of those stories in the book. I have a whole chapter called non-paternity events. And I look at the phenomenon, history of the word, of the term, you know, um, and look at it from all angles, not just the experience of the tester, but of their genetic father who's being discovered and um, his perspective. She also goes through all the other kind of expected theories, the possibility that she's adopted, the possibility that she's donor conceived, the possibility that she comes from a community that hid their genetic ancestry to escape from discrimination, on and on and on and on none of them fit um and so each time we let her we watch her kind of dismiss a theory um we get to see different examples of real americans to whom that's happening and in the end her story um she winds up solving it after all these years and it winds up completely completely surprising um and it goes back 100 years and so one of the really great pleasures of writing the book was getting to go back in time and do century old historical research that was just completely fascinating. I agree that part of the book, well, it was very shocking when you finally find out the, the, uh, the mystery. Um, but yeah, just, it was really, really interesting all the research you did into um, old hospitals and stuff like that. Um, Home DNA testing is a fascinating phenomenon on many levels, but it is oddly both a curiosity or a holiday gift and a profoundly revealing, even life altering catalyst. How is it both? Yeah, so um, it helps to kind of look back at the history of the industry a little bit to kind of like understand how it got to be like a casual purchase, right? Um, so if you Kind of look back I'll, I'll just start by saying recreational dna testing is the term that's used for the kind of tests that you take that are not in the context of a doctor's office but rather you buy them online they send them to your house you spit or you swab your cheek and you send them in and you get back usually people are doing this for ancestry purposes um and, you know they're trying to find out more about their families or their roots or their living relatives sometimes there's a health component that's like kind of usually ta tagged onto that. So you're doing both in one. Um, so recreational DNA testing uh, is defined by two, four major companies. There are other companies in this space, but the four majors are the ones that I, I focused on. Um, and they're the ones where most people are testing um, and they are Ancestry, 
23andMe, MyHeritage, and um, Family Tree DNA. And the industry started with Family Tree DNA down in Houston, Texas, and the very first DNA test kits were sent out by that company in um, April of 2000. So we're just like 21 years into this phenomenon. Um, and back then, it was uh, these results were, you know, the, the testing was very different from what's available now. So they weren't looking at the kind of DNA that's being looked at now. And as a result, the results that you were getting were much less informative. They were giving you a single line along your family tree, not your maternal and your paternal lines, right? They were giving you just a single kind of path through history. Um, and, uh, and it was much more expensive. So, you know, in terms of actual results that you could use to do a lot of research and explore a lot of branches of your tree, not that helpful. Uh, and the guy who started it kind of assumed he was a genealogist himself and he kind of just figured like, this is a niche product. Um, you know, people are gonna buy this because they're obsessives like me. And, you know, and, that, and that's kind of it, right? He didn't kind of see this as like this thing that was gonna be, there wasn't gonna be like ads on primetime TV for this, right? He just imagined it was just for people like him. And it was for a really long time. And then what happened is that the companies figured out how to offer something called autosomal DNA testing. And autosomal DNA testing is looking at, it's looking at your autosomes and it is giving you your maternal and paternal relatives, your immediate relatives. It is telling you how closely you are related to those people. And it is also, so that's one bucket of information and that's people, consumers who have tested in the same database and you match them. And the company knows that you match them because you and they share overlapping genetic segments. And so it can tell you, um, you know, you're this amount related to this person. It can't always identify the nature of the relationship, but it can identify the degree of the relationship. And the other piece of information that it's typically giving you in, with an autosomal DNA test is this um, pie chart. And the pie chart is showing you where your various branches along your tree come from anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years ago. And that is um, a, an estimate. It's, you know, whereas relative matching is a very robust and reliable science, the ethnicity estimates are just that. They are estimates that are constantly being improved because, um, because we are very, very similar to one another on a genetic level. And it is extremely difficult to pick out populations, particularly populations that are quite similar to one another and lived closely together for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's very hard to tell the difference. Um, so. You know, if you look at how the industry sort of became, went from a niche product into something more broad based, you know, it, 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 when Alice tests in 2012, you know, that is a really big deal because that is the moment when Ancestry, which was eventually going to become the big behemoth in the space, that's the moment when they get into this autosomal DNA testing offer. And then if you follow it up through like the teens, you start seeing a lot of advertising and particularly ancestry puts a lot of money into advertising their products so in um, 2016 and then 2017 they put 100 million dollars in advertising in each year and that's when you start seeing ads that are shifting the calculus from serious genealogists to also include the casual consumer so now it becomes sort of thing where it's like um how italian are you right or um you know find out something to share with your family and um there is a there is a framing of this that you are going to get access to under uh, like kind of an understanding of your family but it's going to come it's it might be a little bit surprising but in a kind of a joyous way and it's going to come with a certain amount of like historical and emotional remove not something that's going to like threaten your sense of identity but just something that's going to enhance it right and that is very often what happens right that is for the vast majority of people that is that is exactly what happens they might be like holy cow this is so cool for my genealogy or they might look at their results and say this is kind of boring because it's just what i expected right which is like what a lot of people's reaction and then there is this subset of people who get something else um they get something that really shocks them and suddenly they realize that they have received profound information that's potentially going to affect them for the rest of their lives and the kind of mismatch is between the investment at the start and the results that you're getting because the test is so inexpensive at this point right it's 99 bucks but you can almost always get it on sale maybe 69 maybe even 59 bucks for one of these tests 
we're giving them as gifts. We're giving them as gifts over the holidays and on Father's Day and on Mother's Day, right? So you're getting it as a gift. I got my first DNA test kit as a gift. I've taken three tests, but the very first one came to me in late 2016. Um, and I had no idea what it was. I said yes, because my dad offered to give it to me. And then it kind of just sat there and I didn't really know much about it, right? So the idea that this is a gift for the gift, you know, the gift that you get for the person in your life already has everything, right? This, this casual, no big deal. I got it on sale. I bought it on a lark. That mismatch between the low investment and the high stakes, the potential high stakes, and not knowing if you're going to be one of those people who gets a really surprised result or gets the boring results that are totally in line with what you expect. That is kind of that surprising, fascinating kind of conundrum of this of this industry. Um, you've said that one of the realities of technological advances is that their true impact is hard to anticipate. Is that the case with home DNA testing? I think so. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's sort of a yes and no situation because on the one hand, um, you know, I went down to Texas and I interviewed the founder of Family Tree DNA, which is that oldest company in the US. Um, and I asked him about this and he said, you know, we did get a major surprise even when we were testing the product back in the late 90s, right? So they were testing it with a small group of people to see if it worked. And they discovered, um, you know, a, a major DNA surprise for one of those people who agreed to, to take the test. So as far back as that, I guess, you know, you would say that at the very least, he, Bennett Greenspan, the founder of Family Tree DNA, knew that that was a possibility. And then what happens is that over time, the companies start getting calls to their customer service lines and the calls go something like, your test is telling me that I have an older half sister, but I don't have an older half sister, so your test must be wrong, refund my money. Or they're saying, um, this test is telling me that I you know, am um, part Greek, but I know I'm not part Greek. You must have mixed up my vial with my husband's vial. And in almost every case, it is not the company that screwed up, right? It's we, the consumers that have our history so wrong. Um, so ask me the question one more time because I had something more to say, but I need you to jog okay. my memory by asking it, yeah. Um, you said that one of the realities of te technological advances is that their true impact oh. is hard to anticipate. Yeah, so, so the companies are kind of aware of this, right? And at the same time, if you look at kind of how we imagined what was going to happen with this, we could not have foreseen the ways that it would play out, right? Bennett Greenspan could not have imagined that this would become a mainstream consumer purchase. Um, few would have predicted that law enforcement would be using this to solve long cold cold crimes, right? I mean, that that was something that that few people saw coming, maybe some people in this world, maybe some search angels knew it was possible, but they didn't necessarily assume that it was going to happen. Um, and, uh, and then there's all these kind of fascinating privacy elements to it. And I won't necessarily bore you by going into too much detail unless people have specific questions, in which case I'm happy to answer. I kind of tried to explore the privacy angles from a, you know, a, number, of different, a number of different perspectives in the book. Um, but there's all these ways in which we don't know what happens to this technology. We don't know where it's going. We don't know who will eventually own this data. We don't know um, what um, applications are going to be the most lucrative, which is going to predict where the industry goes, right? And um, is it going to be ancestry and family history testing, or is it going to be health-related testing? And you see the different companies putting different bets on different things, right? What's going to be more lucrative? So that, that's sort of an example of the way that we are just really crummy prognosticators, right? <laughs> like if I had said to you 15 years ago, listen, there's a technology that's gonna be really big and it's gonna like basically explode family secrets and reveal to um, you know well over a million Americans that their genetic origins aren't what they thought. Um, what do you think about that? Uh, you would say, what are you talking about? <laughs> Right? We what are you talking about? We just sequenced the human genome for the first time, right? Um, so the speed of the technology and the impact of this technology is just jaw it's just jaw dropping. It's true. Um, with more than thirty five million people having taken a home DNA test, and the majority of them are American, 
you say that America has reached a tipping point. What are the implications of that? Yeah. So, and it's actually even more now. Um, it was 35 at some point, right? It's 37 now. Um, 37 million people who've taken a DNA test, the majority of them um, Americans. Um, so, you know, there's a Pew research study that says that about 16% of the US adult population has taken one of these mail-in spit kits. Um, but the reality is that at this point, the majority of our population in America is opted in, effectively opted in in some sense to this technology. What do I mean by that? Um, I mean that you may well find something important and, and um, surprising about your own genetic origins, your own health, or your own family, even though you've never tested. Um, and in addition to that, people who are not in the databases are potentially identifiable to somebody who is related to them and looking for them. So why, why is that true? Well, we share overlapping genetic segments with people we're related to, even when we don't know them. And so um, the act of a third cousin deciding to spit into a vial means that I am potentially, um, you know, implicated by, affected by this technology, even if like if I've never, like, I don't even know who this third cousin is, right? So um, I, I'll give you an example. So let's say I have um, a brother and my brother in high school, 30 years ago, uh, he got his girlfriend pregnant and she had a baby and he didn't know it, okay? And then he grew up, he got married and he had children. And here it is 30 years later. And his um, his daughter, the first child that he ever had, but he didn't know it, is all grown up. And she wants to know the identity of her genetic dad. And so she goes to Ancestry and she spits in a vial. And then she looks at her genetic relatives. Now, my brother has never taken a test. He's not interested. He, it's a privacy concern. It's too expensive. He's not even aware of it, whatever. I'm big into family history research, so I've taken a test. And of course, what happens is I show up as a, a very strong match for her. You know, I'm clearly her um, a close relation. I'm her genetic aunt. And she can then take it from there. She can reach out to me and she can say, hey, if you have some brothers, I think one of them might be my dad. Or um, she can just look me up because um, my name is there or enough of my name that it's fairly easy to figure out who I am. And then she looks me up on Facebook, right? And I've left such a rich trail of breadcrumbs of, about myself on, on, online that it is extremely easy to figure out that I have precisely three brothers. And then she can write a letter to all three of them and say, I believe one of them is uh, one of you is my father. And I have a story like that in the book where a man writes a letter to three fathers and sort of like the fallout of that. Um, but for argument's sake, and just to kind of spin out this anecdotal example, um, I don't have to be the sister of the man in question for him to be identified by my decision to test. I could be his first cousin, his second cousin, even third cousins um, make it possible um, for somebody to do this kind of identification. It's not easy um, and it's not always a sure thing, but, but it certainly is possible. And we know that because, um, because adopted people who are unable to access information about their own birth parents because they can't, they're not allowed access to their own birth certificates, um, have long used these techniques to um, get around that lack of access to records and use the databases to find the identities of their birth parents who are not in the system. So um, they pioneered these techniques and Search Angels working with them. Um, and nowadays those techniques are being used by a lot of people who wanna know more about themselves and about their biological families. So I'm sorry, just to just to finish, like the tipping point is essentially this idea that you don't get to opt out anymore, right? You, you to, to a degree, your decision to test or not test is meaningful in terms of certain privacy implications. But to an, another sense, no family can opt out. No American family can opt out because members of the family have already tested. Um, and and that means that it means a few things. It means the era of family secrets is over. Um, it means people are going to find out the truth about their genetic origins, whether or not you tell them, right? They're going to take a test or someone connected to them is going to take a test or their adult child is going to take a test and that information is going to come out. Um, and, and it means we all have to sort of start grappling with the fact that this technology is, is, is pervasive now.
It's fascinating to consider the implications for those who have not been tested. Um, do you want to say any more about that? So, I mean, I think, you know, I think I've probably kind of like, you know, given a, a bunch of that. I mean, I would say, you know, again, the the idea that, you know, you test or don't test may be meaningful in terms of um, certain like issues having to do with potentially gen things like genetic discrimination, which we can talk about and other concerns that people have. Um, but in another sense, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, old secrets, old stigmas, old taboos, all of that is being exploded in this moment. It's, it's leading to a kind of vast intergenerational reckoning about the different ways that families are made, about the different ways babies come into the world mm -hmm. and about the truth about all the things that we were not told. <laughs> it's very, very true. <laughs> um, let's talk further about both the sociological and psychological shifts that you attribute to home DNA testing. Is it fair to say that the sociological shift is primarily a cultural clash between past and present, as well as privacy and transparency? Yeah, I think that's a great way to think about those kind of two collisions, right? Um, on the one hand, you have this present moment we're in, which is a moment of root seeking. Genealogy is really big. Um, and in addition to that, people are, you know, we live in a culture of, of kind of memoir and therapy and speak your truth. Um, and me sharing my story normalizes your experience and all these reasons why we think it's important to speak out, right? Um, and that really runs smack dab into a kind of completely different culture which was the pervasive culture when a lot of people who are was a lot of people who are now taking dna tests were born right mm -hmm. so they were born in a context in which certain things were not talked about either they were private or they were stigmatized um or they could lead to social ostracization or divorce uh or even you know decisions to keep certain things private could be matters of survival so things like um single mo motherhood um, you know, donor conception, um, you know, relationships outside of marriage, um, interracial relationships, right? There's all sorts of reasons why, um, and in even um, uh, violence and, and, and rape and coercion, right? A, a lot of things that um, people didn't speak about the circumstances under which a child was conceived or, or, or came into the world, right? Um, and um, and that those two things are kind of running headlong into each other. Um, and, you know, when a couple or, or a parent makes a decision to kind of keep a secret around how a child has come in, has come into the world, um, that decision has a kind of inertia to it. It, it. it stays suspended in amber, even as the culture around it changes. So there's very often in the interviews I've done in families, like never the right time to like say all of a sudden, by the way, right? By the way, now it's the 90s. Okay, things have changed. By the way, I just want to tell you about when you were born in 1962, right? <laughs> that doesn't happen um, for whatever reasons. I'm, you know, maybe partly because, uh, you know, that, um, you know, a sense of protection towards the child and not wanting to disrupt them. Um, maybe people assume they'll do better if they don't know the truth. Um, maybe those feelings that are attached to the initial creation of this secret. Um, shame, guilt, fear, um, things like that. Maybe those feelings are still very, very strong. Uh, and so you see then this kind of collision between the, the culture of people who want to know the truth because that's the definite, that's how they define themselves is through knowing the truth, right? And this culture of, 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 you know, some things are better left unsaid. And then there's this also this other kind of collision, um, which is between my right to know my own genetic origins and your right to maintain your privacy. Um, and, you know, there's a story in the book about a man named Jason. It's in my chapter on non-paternity events. Um, so Jason, uh, he keeps asking and keeps asking and keeps asking his mom the name of his biological father as an adult. And his mom will never tell him. And they don't have really a, a relationship where um, where he, he gets a lot of opportunity. But whenever he sees her, he does ask and um, she declines to tell him. And um, he finally gets to the point where he he says to her, listen, um, he writes her a letter and he says, you know, you have to tell me um, if you don't tell me, I'm going to start asking around. 
because I hear there are some cousins who might know some things. And, you know, the mom really doesn't want that. She wants, she wants nothing. She wants, she doesn't want any of this talked about. So she gives him, she writes him back. She gives him the name of her college boyfriend and um, Jason reaches out to the guy and they have a relationship and it, the relationship goes on for 12 years. Um, it's a kind of arm's length relationship. It's a little awkward. The guy won't tell um, his own kids that he has this son, right? So it's, it's a bit arm's length. Um, and then Jason takes a DNA test and guess what? It turns out that the man he thinks of his father, he's been meeting with for 12 years is not his genetic father. Um, and someone else is, and you know, that, that to me is this perfect encapsulation of, you know, the mother's desire to maintain her privacy, right? She had a couple of relationships in college, one with a boyfriend and one with somebody who was, it was a briefer relationship. And for understandable reasons, or for whatever reasons, she would have preferred that it be through the lengthier relationship that, that you know, that, that, that is where, or maybe she thought that that was the case. Um, but, you know, there's often this kind of clash. You see a lot of people who are testing now and they're surprised by the results they're going. Their parents are like, how could you not have told me, right? And the parents' response is, um, oh, DNA testing, you know, it's, it's not real. I don't believe it. Don't believe the science. That can't be. And they deny it. Um, because it's, um, you know, it's, they, they want to be able to maintain their privacy. That is a big um, kind of clash that's happening in families. True. Old secrets die hard. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what about psychological transformation? Is it related primarily to surprising revelations? So, um, yeah, there's a lot of, um, I would say, yes. I mean, the, the, the surprising revelations tend to, if they're about your own genetic origins, tend to be described by people going through them as a kind of a trauma. Um, that's the language that people used with me. Um, and that's a language that psychologists who've been through this and are now treating other people tend to use, that it's a trauma. Um, if you get a surprise about your own genetic origin, so for instance, you find out, you know, you were donor conceived 45 years ago and, you know, nobody told you. Um, and and that that has deep implications because, because when you discover that your beginnings change, like the beginning of your story, your once upon a time is different than you thought, um, that actually changes the trajectory of the rest of the story, right? It's not like an isolated thing. You say, oh, let me adjust. The, for the new information, and yet everything else stays the same. It changes everything that ha came after. It changes all your assumptions. It changes your memories of your conversations with your parents. Um, it, it, um, it, it makes you kind of consider the possibility that you might want to reach out to the stranger who contributed half your genetic material. And that is an incredibly fraught experience, um, which I write a good deal about and I've, I've done a lot of research into. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big deal. I'm not sure that it ends for people mm. because I've talked to people and then I've talked to them six months later and then I've talked to them six months later and it's like, this doesn't stop, right? It's not like, um, sometimes in the newspaper, you read a story, oh, two long lost sisters and they had a reunion and it's like wrapped it with a bow and you, you walk away. Like it's, oh, it's not over yeah. for those two sisters. There's then this legacy of bittersweetness, this desire to make up for lost time, but also this knowledge that, um, that they can't, right? That they will never have those shared memories. So there's this incredible loss. Uh, and, and then not even to mention negotiating with like all the other members of the family who maybe kept something, kept something back. So these are incredibly complicated situations, very, very difficult situations for families. So, yeah, I think uh, trauma is probably, that is a great way to, to explain it. Um, cause it's a whole process. Yeah. Um, let's see. How do you find that people respond to non-paternity events, both the seeker who pursued the information and the family members who did not, or really any any kind of the surprises that people yeah. find? So, so the the people who discover the surprises about themselves, there's um sometimes like, you know, if it's about their own origins, right? So it's really really intimate. Um, there's sometimes like a level of denial in the very beginning, and then you know shock, anger. Um, and often a desire to at least research and possibly also reach out to their genetic father if we're using the instance of, of an, a non-paternity event. 
Um, they might want to connect with siblings. Um, you know, they often will see the discovery of their biological kin as part of the process of understanding themselves, like and where they came from. Um, and while it can be really, really painful, um, the vast majority of people I interviewed said they were ultimately glad to know because we value the truth, right? The truth changes the context of everything. Um, and um, it can explain things. It can explain a feeling of not quite fitting in in your family. It can explain um, a talent that, you know, you never understood where it came from. Um, just even the experience of seeing where certain aspects of your mannerisms or your face came from can be like, you know, the, ah, like the sun breaking through the clouds for people, right? It's, it's, it's just absolutely amazing that, that just that gift of, of, of knowledge. Um, and so, and so, right. So when it's painful, sometimes, you know, often very painful, but they'll say they're glad to know. That's not always true for the people on the other side. Um, the people on the other side, maybe like the father, for instance, who maybe didn't know he had a child, he may be super kind of um, wary. Um, he may he may eventually come around to being open armed, um, or he may not. Uh, so you know, in my book, I write about a man who um, uh, deletes his kit and cuts off contact. Right, like so, he basically just takes the information from ancestry, and he like he literally just deletes his entire account, so that mm. he no longer shows up as the father to his his daughter who is 50 years old when she finds him right um and he doesn't return her letters he just he, they have one phone conversation he says he'll think about getting to know her he has a conversation with his family who knows what happens in that conversation and that is it for her she doesn't get to have a relationship with him um there's another story in my book really compelling story of a woman named linda who turns out she's adopted she learns this she learns this from a dna test like what a thing to learn and she learns it shortly after having a, um, a hysterectomy for a health condition that it turned out if she'd known she was adopted, she probably would have known that she did not need the surgery. So it's like a really moving, sad story. Um, she reaches out to her biological father and after a certain point, they talk a couple times on the phone and then he says to her, listen, you know, these phone calls are kind of getting me in trouble with my wife. Um, you know, she's not too keen on knowing the relationships he had before he met her, his wife, right? She doesn't love this. It feels like a threat to their marriage and, and to the sanctity of their family unit. Um, and eventually um, what happens is Linda continues to try to contact him and, um, and contact different members of the family to try to um, gain acceptance because she feels um, just emotionally bereft and she really wants that. Um, he eventually contacts his attorney and he has his attorney send her a letter it's called a discontinuance of contact letter. And it says basically stop reaching out to us. And that is like one of the most uh, whew, wow things that I've ever read, right? It's like, it's like uh, it is so incredibly painful for her, right? Um, and at the same time for him, um, you know, people in these situations can feel very, very threatened. They feel like a stranger is coming into their family. They don't know what their motives are. They, their existence sometimes feels like a threat to narratives that they've long believed in about, say, the faithfulness and loyalty of a husband, right? Um, and so sometimes the easier thing for families is to say, uh, we don't believe it. We just don't believe it. Or we, you know, even when they're actually matching in a system, yeah. I mean, even when they're matching as father and child, which is what's the case for this man, um, you know, we don't believe it, or we just, we, we, we decline to know you. <laughs> hard um so it's 6 45 do you want to take um answer a few more questions or do you want to open it up for questions from um the audience yeah let's open, let's open it up okay. for questions. And, Great. and before, oh. before yeah, we do, I was, yeah i just want to mention if since you know while you're here um if you're interested, I have a newsletter. I'm going to put it in the chat. It's at my website, which is libbycopeland.com. And so I send out um news about DNA and family secrets and family revelation and genealogy and the truth about the past. And I write like op-eds and columns and stuff. So I, I put those into the newsletter, which comes out about once a month. Um, and it's private. I don't like sell anyone's email address, but um, that is free. I'll put that in the chat if you want to sign up. And the other thing is, 
Um, I'm supporting a local bookstore near my house. So my book is widely available if you want to buy it. But if you want a signed and personalized copy, which is kind of a cool thing that you get at a book signing, but of course we don't do book signings anymore because of the <laughs> pandemic, um, you can contact them. And they're, I'm going to put them in the chat. They're called the Village Bookstore in Pleasantville, New York. You can call them up and I can sign a copy and they will ship anywhere in the country. So I'm just going to put Great. that in there. Great. Um, and so for our audience, um, I know we have Lisa asked a question earlier, but um, if you guys want, you can either turn your audio and video on or you could just um, type it in the chat and I will read it out loud for you. So Lisa asked, um, why do you think this has developed in the US versus the rest of the world? That's a great question. Um, Genealogy is a really big deal for Americans right now. Okay, why? Um, a few a few reasons. Um, one is that most Americans come from someplace else. And there's this strong process of assimilation, particularly um, in certain eras. Um, that means that immigrants who came over lost a lot of things, right? They lost some of their language, they lost some of their traditions, they, um, their foods you know, they assimilated, they learned how to make American foods, whatever American foods were at the time. And there's a lot of Americans and particularly um, white Americans who don't know where they come from. Like they don't know it. They don't know where their grandfather's from. Um, and that is, um, th that has led to a kind of moment where a lot of Americans at this point are kind of looking up and being like, but wait, but wait a minute, what, what, you know, what's going on? Like, who, who am I from? Uh, this has coincided with uh, a, a, like a kind of a cultural phenomenon, right? You see a lot of TV shows, Finding Your Roots, Who Do You Think You Are? They're absolutely fascinating, right? And there's this idea that through understanding the past, you can understand yourself. We happen to be um, becoming, I would describe us as kind of a nation of seekers people who are invested in this idea that if you know your roots, you will better understand like the context for how you got there and then indeed perhaps understand like your life a little bit better, right? Uh, and, in, and then in addition to that, there's never been a better time to be a genealogist because there's never been more records and uh, available online. There are literally tens of billions of records available online and more every day um, by fr some free services, some subscription services where you can do research and then there's so many people who are taking DNA test and DNA testing begets DNA testing because the more people who are in a database, the more interesting and evocative your results are, right? I mean, if I took a test back in 2012 when Alice was testing, like I would have been lucky to find like a fifth cousin, right? Um, and, in, and nowadays I test and I can immediately get, you know, in addition to the my parents and my brother who I know I've tested, I'm going to very quickly find maybe a first cousin once removed, right? Um, or or an aunt or something like that. So, you know, the, all of those forces kind of have come together. And then in addition to that, there's reasons why elsewhere people are more resistant. Um, there are regulatory concerns in some places. There are cultural concerns in some places, um, places like Germany, for instance, a lot of Germans are very comfortable with the idea of ethnicity testing. They think it sounds a little too, um, too much like eugenics, too much, too kind of disturbing to look for this evidence of biological difference, right? Um, and then on top of it, um, a lot of people, a lot of places in the world, um, particularly if you're talking about in Europe, where um, where these, you know, there may be ads for these um, products, um, they are not so invested in trying to figure out where they're from or who am I because they are like, they already know, cause they're like, I'm from here, right? Cause they may have deep roots in an area. Uh, they may have like a family Bible that goes way back or, um, you know, just, you know, ancestors, they may live in their ancestral home. So there's not this kind of deep curiosity of like, what am I? So all those reasons contribute to sort of why, you know, the US is the place where this has really exploded. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions from the audience? Feel free to either jump on video or you can put it in the chat. And even if it seems like a basic question and you think maybe someone else knows, feel free to ask because um, in my experience, the person who asks the question 
that they think might be too simple, they're actually, everyone else is extremely grateful that they asked that question. Because um, <laughs> they're all wondering it too. So um, if you're a beginning genealogist, you know, feel free to ask any kind of basic questions about the industry. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I, these are just kind of weird things that I was thinking about because um, I'm still in the process of learning about um, genealogy and DNA, but um, it, it, you can choose whether to share your DNA on these services generally, correct? Yeah, that's right. You can usually choose whether to share. So you, so if you don't want to see your relatives or have them see you, you can do that. There's no way to surreptitiously view your relatives and not have them see you. So you can't do that research, um, you know, without being seen. So, so it's not complete consent, consent on both ends, but generally there is as much consent as like on both ends of these, um, say, um, unknown family members finding out that each other exists and connecting. There was some level of consent and that they allowed it to be um only if up. only if they're being found because they're in the database but remember you don't have to be in the database in order to be discovered oh really okay yeah that, that was going to be my next question you know like i was thinking of the story about the gentleman whose mother wouldn't you know gave the wrong um person who he contacted mm -hmm. for 12 years i was like he was not in the database well how did how did he know that his father wasn't his father did his father also take a test or what what happened so what happened was that the man that he thought was his father um knew his background you know i don't remember what he was but let's say he was like german and swedish um so Jason takes this test and he didn't really know the ins and outs, but he had a friend who was a genealogist who knew a ton about this. And he takes this test and he looks at the ethnicity estimate and it, it's um, whatever his mom was, let's say she was Italian American. And then the other half was not German and Swedish, but something very, very different. Now that, um, that in and of itself wouldn't be enough to give you necessarily a clue. Um, and sometimes the ethnicity estimates are imperfect. But it was enough different that his genealogist friend said, this doesn't look quite right. Let me see what I can figure out. And what he did was he, he sketched a tree for Jason. So he found, he was able to figure out who the relatives were on Jason's paternal side within the system. And from those people figuring out the relationships is like pieces of a puzzle. He, um, he was able to research back and figure out a most recent common ancestor and then come back down in time and do research um, using all sorts of, of um, things on the internet, including like Facebook and, you know, um, people finder, you know, things like that. Um, obituaries, like births, all that kind of records of like present day. And he was able to figure out that based on the cousins that were matching um, uh, Jason in the database, it had to be one of three sets, one of three brothers. So Jason wrote a letter to all three brothers, and um, and you know one of <laughs> one of the brothers was like it it I, it led to some difficulties in his marriage because his wife was like what, but it turned out it was a different brother, and they met in in a bar and um, they looked at each other and the guy said, oh you're my kid, I remember your mom, we look just like each other, and Jason said. I believe you, but just to be sure, because I've been through this before, <laughs> let's, let's go to Walgreens and take a paternity test. And that's what they did. And they took a paternity test, which is like different than, you know, an ancestry test. It's like uh, it, it's a different kind of um, measurement, so to speak. And, and it's not public. And you and you, um, you know, I think you both swab your cheek and then you like mail it into a lab and they got their results back and they were father and son. And, and I mean, I, I, most of the situations I'm talking about are situations where people are finding genetic parents who have not taken a DNA test. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's see, in the chat, we have AK McFall and they ask, after the US, which, what country uses the test the most? So Canada and England and Australia are all um, greater users. And there are some other companies, uh, countries as well that are, um, you know, I think primarily in Western Europe. Yeah. All right. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can raise your little hand if you want. I never know how to find that hand. Do the, I don't either. <laughs> yeah. Oh, somebody's turning on there. Um, oh, okay, great. So Pat, if you, can you unmute? Yes, thank you. I, I'm in a small genealogy class and one of the words that uh, I use in that class when we're talking about genea uh, DNA is uh, powerful. Uh, I think that uh, that is a fairly good warning to people. Uh, you know, I never want to really make decisions for them wh which way they should go, but uh, you know, it is sort of a warning in a way. But at the same time, we all know stories that, uh, like I said, are, are wrapped up in bows. And so, so we, just, uh, we just never know. Uh, and uh, for people who uh, today, obviously, uh, you know, you, you can't sit uh, and watch evening TV and broadcast TV these days without hardly seeing a commercial by Ancestry.com DNA. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. Yeah, that, that that what you said about how much they invest in in advertising is isn't that amazing? Oh yeah, it's it's unbelievable. And They're of course, totally it fits right into Americana, you know. So yes, yes. <laughs> so it is uh, it is who we are and what we do, and uh, yeah. I, I I just I just think it's great. And I yeah. I tried to jot down some of the uh, uh, your expressions and uh, terms and all, and they're, they're just fascinating, great, great Thank things. You. And, uh, I, and think, uh, I think your use of the word powerful is a very ethical choice. Yeah. That's an ethical choice because I think, you know, people need to know the power of it mm -hmm. and nobody should be pushed into it or kind of um, made to think that it's no big deal because it's a big deal, right? Um, and what I've found over and over is that people do better when they've made the decision themselves to test than when somebody like kind of like pushed them into it or twisted their arm or gave them information before they were ready, right? Because agency is important. Autonomy is important. So if you're going to make a discovery that's going to, you know, forever change the rest of your life, let it be you who's in charge. Let it be you who's invested in the process. Let it be you who did the genealogical research to unravel it or ask those key questions. So um, the word powerful is very important because, you know, you're not you're not stacking the debt. You're not putting your thumb on the scale and saying, oh, just take a test so the rest of us can all benefit because, of course, genealogists often do want other people to take. They, they have this idea, which is quite right, that the more people who take a DNA test, the better it is for everyone to, to do their discovery but it is also, it should be an informed choice. And so I think I like your, your I like your word choice. Thank you. And of course, one of the other words that I use in a genealogy class is that uh, I think today we are so, uh, it's so important for us to be responsible and almost an obligation to do yeah. genealogy. I mean, uh, we're in a senior class and, and really, uh, I ask people, you know, if not you, who? And uh, uh, you just think you're always wanting to find a note or the, the paper or information in the Bible here and there, a record that some ancestor left. And I said, you know, you have an enormous, you know, field to pick from there with, uh, like I said, thousands and thousands yeah. of records. There. Yeah. And so with true. the internet and what we have at our fingertips, it's shame on us if we can't uh, organize it and share it. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a great perspective. Thanks. This is a wonderful thing, this Zoom stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all the way in New York. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so far away. And, and just to mention real quick, you know, the classes that I'm in, we have a lot of African American in our classes in Southeast Louisiana. They're, usually, when they do their DNA, they find out a, a big percentage of their uh, uh, European ancestry is there, you know. And so, uh, yeah. But sometimes it's not a question of is there, it's no, a yeah. question of how much. And, yeah. and I always yeah. use that word estimate on that, you know, because yeah. that, that's a great thing to remember. 
Um, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the great things of researching this book was understanding how the African American community uses DNA specifically, and I have a number of stories in there. It, that was such a cool thing to be able to report, you know, because they, in particular, uh, often need DNA to get around that brick wall, right? I mean, they really can use DNA DNA because they're particularly disenfranchised by the lack of records. Um, and so I have some really cool stories that I've come across over the years um, and was able to tell about um, about African-American genealogists being able to trace their stories. And that, I just, that's, really, that's really powerful to use your word. That's really well, we have a lot of free people of color here. So uh, uh, it's, it's just incredible uh, yeah. the, the history that's involved here. And uh, I, I always uh, go on with the fact that estimate uh, on the... Uh, Ethnicity, uh, just think, matching a relative is not estimate, that's for sure. I mean, and that's an important point for people to understand is that the, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, just because the estimates are not reliable doesn't mean that uh, this person isn't related to you. Those are two different, two different buckets of information relying on two different approaches and kinds of, uh, you know, analysis. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you and thank Amanda for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Adrian, I'm going to go. I know Amanda's going to do a All presentation right. on, on the archives, which sounds fascinating. I'm sorry I can't stay for that. But thank you so much for having me. And I really thank appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. It was great. Thanks. All right. Have a, Have good, a good night. night. Bye, Libby. Oh, goodness. That was wonderful. That, that was great. That was great. All right, so now Amanda is going to give us, um, she's, an, she's an archivist and librarian here at the New Orleans Public Library, and she's going to do a brief presentation about some of uh, the New Orleans Public Library's uh, genealogy resources. So take it away, Amanda. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, I won't lie, I recognize some names here tonight. I know you guys, this is gonna be broken record for some of you. You guys are gonna know a lot of what I'm going to talk about here. Um, I will say, uh, I, I don't know if we've had this conversation, but a conversation that I've had with a lot of um, you know fellow genealogists in the archives is we hit those dead ends. We hit those blank spots. We hit that um, the uh, inequity of records. And a lot of times, I start to say without having quite as much experience, I mean, with everybody is, well, at this juncture, there's DNA. And um, what, um, so, so we're kind of working backwards here. I'm actually just going to give you a quick rundown of the genealogy databases that we have for traditional genealogy, non-DNA genealogy that are available through the New Orleans Public Library. Um, we do offer several services for free, but, um, DNA will not be one of them. Um, it's not something that we will dabble in as, a, as, as you know, public servants, but um, it's interesting to think about. Um, and it's, this, this is, of course, um, as, as both uh, Libby and Pat noted, is you do have to do, even if you do do your DNA or you do find a match or there is like some, some indication of a mystery, you will eventually have to come back to the records and the family tree and the information that is shared on the internet, like Pat said, to, to fully assemble. Like the DNA is sort of like the clue and then um, the genealogy become, the genealogy, the family tree becomes what you form from it. But with that being said, uh, let's get through this real quick. It won't be too long. I won't keep you for long and I can take some questions afterwards, okay? Okie doke. So, of course, um, I'm going to speak from the perspective of New Orleans Public Library, but I know that Jefferson Parish and St. Tammany Parish um, all offer the same stuff and in some cases more. But the three main things that we offer with your New Orleans Public Library card is Ancestry.com Library Edition, Heritage Quest, and Fold 3. So Ancestry Library Edition is the enhanced library database version of Ancestry, which is the large, as, as you all are really familiar with. Um, is the largest um, and most popular genealogy website on the market. Now, um, Ancestry uh, Library Edition includes 
a lot of stuff. It includes the US, UK, Canadian, and European records that Ancestry offers, um, all the usual suspects, vital statistics, military records, ships, passenger list, etc. What it doesn't offer, it offers some public family trees that you can look at, but you can't um, make your own with a free account. You would have to have a paid account to make your own family tree, but you can view members public family trees, which is probably um, if you are doing DNA sleuthing and you do end up on that journey, what you might be looking at the most once you make some connections through um, a DNA matching service, such as, um, uh, um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the uh, main one, if anybody can help me, um, GED match. Um, which is kind of one that links uh, data from all the services, uh, Ancestry, uh, 23andMe, um, other small startups. It's sort of a, a, a place where if you've taken multiple tests, you can aggregate or, you know, you're going to try to connect with somebody who may have taken a 23andMe test versus you took an Ancestry test. GD match is, I think, or is it, am I saying it right? Does anybody know? I'm pretty sure it's GD match. Um, it will connect that data that DNA data is across services, so to speak. But um, back to back to non-DNA stuff, Ancestry Library Edition is available on site at any of the library locations, which at this juncture, you can uh, call any library location for an appointment to use the computers if you need to. However, you don't actually have to do that until the end of June because Ancestry has graciously allowed everybody with a card to do Ancestry Library Edition at home with their card. And we don't know, but they may even extend it past then. We'll see how things go, but they've been very generous and made all their library edition versions free to library users um, throughout the pandemic, which is wonderful. Um, but of course, yes, you can go to the uh, public libraries as well. Now, Heritage Quest is a large genealogy database. It's developed by ProQuest, which is a big genea or not genealogy, a big database seller. Like, is it a news database? Is it a stocks database? Is it a genealogy database? ProQuest is probably one of the main brokers of that. But what they've developed is Heritage Quest, which is powered by Ancestry's technology and databases. So what it is, is it looks and the search, it looks similar. They use um, co-owned record sets and everything works very closely. So if you know how to do Ancestry, you know how to do Heritage Quest. Um, According to them, they offer the one unique thing that they offer is over 28,000 books currently available, which are going to be like local family histories and stuff. The stuff that you would normally come to the city archives on the third floor of the main library to look through. Like we have an extensive, um, you know, like we have like small genealogy periodicals like the Attack of Paw Gazette or, you know, um, um, oh goodness, uh, Southeastern genealogy. Um, we're kind of you would come to us to look at these things, what Heritage Quest offers that's unique from Ancestry is this sort of stuff. We are not going over these records in depth later. I apologize, y'all. <laughs> um, Heritage Quest, as with all the databases, is completely free with your library card and can be accessed at home with uh, Jefferson, NOPL, East Baton Rouge, um, St. Tammany library cards. Um, it offers a few resources that Ancestry doesn't keep in their main stable, and it offers many that do not. Now, um, it has all the usual suspects. It has the census, it has city directories, it has immigration, it has all the main things you need. So if you need, to, and, and because the census is almost always a very important and critical starting point, like it's Heritage Quest is great on its own to have that. Okay. Um, Fold3 is a military records database, and it again is powered by Ancestry.com, but the layout and tools don't look the same in this one, they look similar, and they act a bit differently. Um, now what it does offer is original military records, records include the stories, photos, and personal documents of the men and women who served in the military, and uh, it goes basically from very early um, wars, you know, revolutionary war, possibly earlier, and um, it, I would say it comes up to about the early 1900s in publicly available records and then user generated records um, for more modern things are also available on there. Um, again, just before I move on, I want to emphasize that Ancestry Library Edition can be used at a library branch in public in person and at home through the end of June at least. 
Heritage Quest and Fold 3 can always be used at home. So how do you get there? If you, and this will work for um, any Louisiana parish resident whose library system subscribes to these services, which at, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but at this juncture is Orleans, Jefferson, St. Tammany, and East Baton Rouge that I know of in my heart. I know there are probably more like Charles May, Calcasieu, um, but you can actually just do it like the way I'm going to show you, no matter which one of those cards you hold which is you can go to our website, which is nolalibrary.org and you can click on research and then databases. And what happens is you get led to this central gateway. This is how you do it on Jefferson. You go to Jefferson Parish, jplibrary.net and then you go to databases. But um, what, what you will be sent to no matter what is the Louisiana Library Connection. So this is the Louisiana Library Connection. At this juncture, this is where it asks you for your library card number. And um, that's any one of those will work and will essentially get you the same services. You can go directly to this URL that I have across the top of the screen here, and I can enter that in chat in a minute as well. Um, so, of course, no matter what route you take, if you are accessing the databases from home, you will need to enter that library card number right there. Now, when you're in there, it's going to look similar to this, but you choose the databases you want to use from the My Libraries databases side that is over to the um, left hand side of the screen. The options may look slightly different depending on which parish card you logged in with, but they'll always be alphabetical. If you're looking for Ancestry Library Edition, it's going to be in the A's, whether you're signing in from Jefferson or Orleans. And same for Heritage Quest or Fold 3 or any additional, um, you know, databases that your parish library may have. Um, this is just kind of what they look like. I know they've since changed the, uh, oh, there's Fold 3. I know they change the pictures regularly, but this is essentially what it looks like when you get to these three. If you, if you haven't already, but I imagine if you're here at the DNA thing, you've either read the book and are intrigued by the story or you're working on DNA genealogy already, at which juncture you've probably experienced all of these services. But um, I'm going to give you some searching tips and best practices just in case. Um, they're pretty basic. Uh, basically, um, don't, don't walk in and say, I want to make my family tree today because you won't. It's not going to happen. It, researching your family tree is is a lifelong research project it it's going to take you years it's going to take you decades it gets a little faster in the internet age but you know every time you sit down to do it have a goal like i have here like say i want to know when this person was born or i want to know who this person was married to and that's your goal for the day um, be prepared to work, have your notebook or binder, your memory stick, and never assume that it's only going to take you 10 or 15 minutes. You will get lucky, but not every time, especially the further back you go. You're going to need to make notes and you're going to need to save, um, you know, save images or links from these services that you're using. Um, Basic search tips. Uh, so, of course, avoid doing a general search from the home page. You want to learn about the record sets offered by each service, Ancestry, Heritage Quest, Fold 3, so you know where to start searching for the type of record that you want to find today, whether What's it's a church line or like um, a... I think somebody's mic may be on. Um, but uh, just um, that sort of thing. Uh, of course, these are um, the these are the rote things that you want to know is how to make your adjustments. Um, of course, you want to choose exact if you want an exact name. Sounds like similar or initial. Sounds like is phonetic, um, and similar is is similar spelling things. But what you can also do, I want to point out that on fold three, it's a little basic. You don't get to do your filtering until after you type something in here. Whereas on Ancestry, you start with a big old box that says, put in all the information you can think of, which you shouldn't, by the way. But but um, the one thing you can do on Fold 3 is you can choose which WARS records you want to um, see before you do the search. And then after that, that's when you pick all your sorting options. Um, this is an advanced search thing, but this is something that will work on the three services, which is if you want to replace a character in a word or to um, up to five characters at the end of a word, use star. 
Um, if you only want to replace one character, use a question mark. This will allow you to find similar names because we all know that um, Johns, Johnson, Johnston, John, those all get mixed up over time, um, especially down a family line. And, and as I set, showed on one of the previous screens, like Follis is, I think it started, it started out as FA, but then like very early on, it split into some FAs and some FOs. It was an FO for a while and then it became an FA again. You know, it happens. Um, of course, all of this is to say, be flexible. Records have spelling changes and errors that you can learn to anticipate. And ages and birth dates often vary by a few years. And then databases can only give you what they have, not what you think it should be. That's why you need to be flexible. Um, here's a couple of troubleshooting tips uh, before I finish up here. But uh, each database offers help in tutorials, usually found along the top menu. If you're not familiar with using a database, look for the tutorial and watch it or follow it. They're usually pretty good. Um, if you aren't getting any results, uh, one thing that you want to do is reduce the complexity of the search terms you entered. You might want to take out a first name or a middle name if you put that in, or you might want to replace the first name with just an initial, like an A and a star. Um, if you're looking for someone with a more unusual first name, you do stand a better chance of finding the person in the database because it's hard to um, misspell their name on a record if it's something like that people aren't used to doing. It's interesting. Um, now, uh, you want to think about common nicknames and variations in your search field, of course. Um, you know that Mama Pris is actually named um, Donis, and, um, but you know she may have put Prissy on some of those census things when the census man came around and asked her. It's stuff to think about if you, it's close enough relative that you might know. Um, if you're limiting yourself geologically, geographically in one of your searches expand it you know don't limit your looking in new orleans you're not getting any results um expand it to orly to well not to orleans parish really expand it to the state um because orleans parish and new orleans uh, occupy the same <laughs> the same land mass um and of course make sure you're in the right collection when you're searching um basically uh you know you're not going to find your birth records in a Civil War draft collection. It's that sort of thing. Just make sure you know where you are on the website at any given time. Usually there's some sort of header somewhere along the top or over on the side that'll say about this collection or something similar. Now, of course, another thing to do is to try to trace identified relatives of your target. If you already know, like, a mother, a brother, a sibling, a child, an aunt, an uncle, um, a next door neighbor, try following them and seeing if your target does pop up on a census record as either a boarder or a, or a child or a parent, something like that. And then of course, if you are getting no results, the big thing is to try DNA services such as the ones discussed today. Um, uh, as she mentioned, with each, um, as, as they aggregate more data from more users, they are becoming a little more pinpointed in their results and how correct they are. Um, it's, it, it, this can be helpful. As, as both Pat and uh, Libby explained, though, it's, it's very fraught. Um, I, as Pat said, it's powerful. You have to make that decision, and you also have to make the decision to respect the, the wishes of the person on the other end if you do make a connection. If for some reason they do not want, it, it's this is the second level of consent, so to speak. There's, if you both took an ancestry DNA test and decided to share your information on the site, that's one level of consent. But then when you start interacting, if both parties do not want to continue the interaction, that's the second level of consent in DNA testing. And it's very important to respect it, even if it is painful. Um, you know, it, consent is a powerful thing because it can lead to pain, either from not getting what you want or from finding something you didn't want to find. Um, of course, where historic records have gaps, DNA may be able to restore and discover connections. And um, as, as people were discussing, um, African American records, um, the record keeping, they were not treated equitably even in record keeping in America. 
uh, they do not have the same paper trail due to government agencies either just not be them not being able to access the agency or the agency making no attempt to access them. But then in addition to that, when you get to um, when you get to the issue of slavery, uh, people were described just by their their age and sex, and and that's that's a real roadblock. Um, DNA services can be a very critical element um, in finishing your family tree um, with African American genealogy in America. Um, that being said, I'm going to say questions. I kept it short, but um, for anybody who has any questions, please go ahead now. Is the 1950 federal census now available? No, it will be available in 2022. They do 72 years as the holding period on each census because I believe when they decided this, it was like the average um, lifespan of an American. <laughs> Does anybody else have any um, questions or anything additional? It is GED to match. Thank you, Carol. Well, if nobody else has any questions, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put the archives email in the chat. Um, it's archivist at nolalibrary.org. You can email us anytime and we will get back to you. And I'll also put our website, which is archives.nolalibrary.org. And it's got all the same contact information, including our phone number. Um, we are allowing people by appointment right now, and we will continue to do that um, for some period. Um, regardless of what the general library use does. So um, just email us or call us and we can determine what we need to retrieve for you and get you that appointment scheduled. Just a comment about the 1950 census. Yes. Uh, even though it's gonna be released from the government records uh, a year from now, I'm not sure that it's gonna be immediately available for us to search because that has to be indexed, you know, and they have to do that probably through volunteers because it's yeah. even going to be bigger than the 1940 census, which probably took a while. That is an excellent point, actually. Um, services like Ancestry, while they are large companies, can't can't equal as are needed to get through that ream of information. It's 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 every year. I would say it's an exponential growth in in uh, people in a census, and that's an excellent point, Pat. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I loved Libby's talk. I'm going to be reading the book now. <laughs> Shame on me for not doing it yet. And um, in the future, we'll look into talking about DNA and stuff like that through um, the City Archives programming. If y'all are interested. Oh, and if you want to follow us, let me do my Facebook before I sign off here. That's us. Facebook.com Lou Div. Thanks, Amanda. Um, that was really great. Uh, so was Libby's talk. And thank you for everyone for coming and listening and for your questions. Um, unless anyone has anything else they wanna ask, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off and I hope everybody has a great night. All right, thank good you, night, Amy. everyone. Good night. Good night. Good to see you, Pat. <laughs> okay.